Welcome to CIS 579, Technology of E-Business. My name is Dr. Schuessler and this is Chapter 14, E-Commerce, Regulatory, Ethical, and Social Environments. After reading this chapter, you should be able to understand some of the foundations for legal and ethical issues in e-commerce. You should be able to describe the intellectual property laws and understand how those are, are handled. You should be able to explain privacy and free speech issues and, and the challenges that go along with those. You should be able to describe so, several different types of fraud that occur on the internet and how to protect yourself against those. You should also be able to describe the needs and methods to protect both buyers and sellers. You should be able to describe e-commerce related societal issues. And lastly, you should be able to describe green e-commerce and IT. Before we jump into the issue of ethics, we really kind of need to know what the definition of ethics is. And a formal definition is that it's it's the branch of philosophy that deals with what is considered to be right and wrong. And oftentimes people um, tend to blur the, the, the meaning of ethics and morality. And they are very similar concepts. They're obviously very much so related. Morality tends to be, be associated more with one's personal character and how they define uh, um, the right and wrong actions as it relates to that. Whereas ethics tends to deal more with uh, more of a group type of behavior, whether it be at work or in a uh, in school or, or things of that nature. Uh, there's also the issue of privacy, the right to be left alone and free of un unreasonable personal intrusions. So with those couple of definitions out of the way, we can kind of jump into ethics a little bit more in, in a little bit more detail. As it relates to e-commerce, ethical issues are, are really all around us. We, we certainly have a lot of, of ethical issues that we have to consider and that we have to be aware of. Uh, for example, think about this video that you're watching right now. Uh, who owns that content? I'm the originator of that content. I've created this content. Um, but does that mean that I'm the owner of it? Because I'm posting it to YouTube. Does YouTube, because they're hosting it, because they're providing it as a service to you as the viewer, uh, do they own the content? Does the publisher who has put together some of the slides and, and helped to create some of the content, do they own, um, do they own the, the, the content? Uh, it really becomes a very murky area of, of, uh, of who, owns, who owns the content. So this kind of leads us to, to a more specialized area of, of, of ethics or a specific area of ethics uh, referred to as business ethics, a form of applied ethics that examines ethical principles and moral or ethical problems that arise in a business environment. And these are things that you're going to run across in your, in your, daily, day, uh, uh, in your daily lives. There's the issue of Internet abuse in the workplace. In other words, do you check personal email at work? Do you surf the internet while at work, playing games or booking reservations for a flight or a hotel or something of that nature? You're using that employer's resources. You're using their internet uh, um, access. You're using their hardware to be able to surf the internet on personal time. It's an abuse if you were taking home uh, pens and, and paper and things like that from the workplace, that'd be theft. And it's not really any different. Um, so there's that ethical dilemma, if you will. On the flip side, there's the issue of monitoring employees. Is that ethical? Certainly a business has a right to, to make sure that their employees are working and doing what they're supposed to be doing. But how much can they really monitor their, their employees and, and still be ethical? Can they monitor the keystrokes that they're doing on their, on their, on their keyboard? Uh, can they monitor their trips to the bathroom? Things like that. So there are lots of ethical issues that occur in the workplace as well. In addition to some of the ethical issues that we just got through talking about in terms of intellectual property rights and privacy, there are also there's also the issue of free speech, free speech versus censorship. As an organization, we have to be very careful about the walking this line. It's a fairly uh, a thin line that we have to kind of balance our approach on. Uh, for example, there there was a case relatively recently where um, courts determined that if an employee writes something despairingly on a blog, for example, somewhere online, and no one responds to it, that potentially that person can be fired um, for disparaging remarks, and it really sort of depends on their, their terms of employment. 
Yet at the same time, if another employee responds back to that, now it becomes free speech. There's a dialogue going on between these two individuals. It's free speech. It's covered, covered under free speech um, and, and cannot be censored. Uh, there's also the consumer and merchant protection against fraud. The success of e-commerce really depends on both consumers and merchants feeling like it's a relatively safe environment. In other words, they're going to be able to buy and sell goods in a safe environment um, with, with limited risk of, of fraud being of, of fraud occurring. So that's an issue. Now we just got through talking about non-work related use of the internet uh, a moment ago when we talked about people surfing the internet on, on company time. One of the ways to protect yourself against things like that is through the use of an acceptable use policy. Um, and this acceptable use policy basically is a, an example of the organization's code of ethics. They're going to, to basically spell out what is acceptable use of company time, company equipment, uh, company uh, resources such as internet access. Uh, and without this acceptable use policy, uh, it makes it really difficult to, to to discipline and, and respond to uh, violations of the code of ethics that, that an organization may, may or may not actually have in writing. Um, so an acceptable use policy is a very important thing. Usually it's something that uh, a user simply clicks on when they log into a system. Uh, it's displayed. Sometimes it's shared with them when they uh, begin employment. Um, I really like the idea of it being when you log in. It's, even though most people never read those, uh, it, it really is because it's in, in front of them all the time. Hopefully it helps to kind of jog their, mem uh, their memory regularly that way. So what are some of the things that should probably go into that acceptable use policy or AUP guideline? Uh, things like internet and communication system use, including email and, and, and instant messaging. What can they include in those, those uh, uh, types of communication mediums and, and what should they not include? Make it clear to employees that they cannot use copyright or trademark material without permission. Uh, you're really just trying to protect the company uh, from a legal standpoint that way. Maybe in terms of, of uh, copyrighted software, for example, not using pirated software. Post disclaimers concerning content such as sample code that the company does not support. Post disclaimers of responsibility concerning content of online forums and chat sessions. In other words, you know, especially in these online chat sessions, they're live. They're, you, know, you have the opportunity to really send out information um, um, that you really, as an organization, don't want to send out very quickly. So you have to be very careful in those environments. Make sure the web content and activity comply with the laws in other countries, such as those governing contests and privacy. There was a case several years ago. Uh, I, I believe it was, it may have been with Yahoo. Uh, I don't recall, or maybe it was uh, uh, eBay where you had Nazi, uh, Nazi memorabilia being sold in Germany, which is, is illegal, um, but it was being sold by people out of the country. Uh, so it, it becomes a very um, uh, difficult area to navigate uh, in terms of, of selling in to other markets. You all of a sudden have to become very aware of the, law, the legal systems that are occurring in the countries that you're selling to. Make sure the company's web content policy is consistent with other company policies. Appoint someone to monitor internet legal and liability issues and have that person report to a senior executive or legal counsel. And finally, have attorneys with cyber law expertise review web content to make sure that there's nothing unethical or illegal on the company's website and that all required statements and disclaimers are properly included. Intellectual property in e-commerce is really a big deal because not only is it about protecting the content such as, as uh, digital works and songs and, and uh, um, images, things of that nature, but also in terms of the, a lot of the e-commerce system itself, the, the software and things of that nature. So intellectual property is a really big deal. Um, before we jump into the rest of that, let's, create a, let's have a definition of intellectual property. Intellectual properties, creations of the mind, such as inventions, literary, literary and artistic works, and symbols, names, images, and designs used in commerce. So think of a book. That's intellectual property. Somebody wrote that book. They, they arranged the words in a particular pattern, a particular sequence. It's an artistic work. It's an expression of the mind. 
Intellectual property law is an area of law that includes patent law, copyright law, trademark mark law, trade secret law, and other branches of the law such as licensing and, un uh, and unfair competition. Intellectual property law is designed to create a structure to be able to protect an individual's or an, an organization's intellectual property. Different areas of intellectual property law are designed to protect different types of works of the mind. So, For example, copyrights are an exclusive right of the author or creator of a book, movie, musical composition, or other artistic property to print, copy, sell, license, distribute, transform to another medium, translate, record, perform, or otherwise use. If you infringe on that right, that's to use the work without permission or contracting for, for payment of a royalty. In other words, you take part of that book, you take part of that movie, you sell it, and you make a profit off of that. That's against copyright law. You can be sued for that. You can, can be forced to pay damages. There are some nuances to copyright law that allow the use of this, uh, of, of another's uh, work um, without payment. For example, there's a, the fair use doctrine, uh, if you will, that allows, for example, educators or people in um, uh, the news to be able to use pieces of work usually not in their entirety, but portions of their work to be able to, in the case of a news reporter, to talk about uh, uh, part of it in a news context, um, to be able to review that movie, to be able to review a book, um, or in, in, in our sense for educators, to be able to educate other uh, students and things of that nature. So there are some little nuances that allow you around intellectual property law, but those are usually very specific situations uh, and for the most part, if, if you're not using it as intended, you're infringing on the, the author's work and, and uh, run the risk of being sued uh, over that use. For digital content, such as a digital book or m digital movie, uh, uh, one that you can, be download, can be downloaded or is on a disc or something of that nature, rather than a legal remedy, um, in some cases, you can apply a physical memory, a, a remedy or a, a technical remedy, if you will. And that's where DRM comes in, digital rights management. It's an umbrella term for any uh, of several arrangements that allow a vendor to, of content in electronic form to control the material and restrict its usage. In other words, you can limit how many times something, you know, a file might be able to be copied or whether or not it can be printed. Um, whether or not it can be emailed or forwarded and things like that. So there's certain things that you can do to help protect your electronic uh, um, um, assets, if you will. Again, what I'm, I mentioned a moment ago was the, the fair use doctrine or fair use clause, if you will. The legal use of copyrighted material for non-commercial purposes without paying royalties or getting permission. And I already talked about that just a second ago. Now, to be able to protect something, uh, intellectual property, that's a physical uh, um, manifestation, if you will, a, a car, for example, a, a computer, something physical, something you can grab, that's when you're going to apply for a patent. And that's a document that grants the holder exclusive rights to an invention for a fixed number of years. Whereas a patent protects a physical good or a physical uh, uh, invention, a trademark is something that symbolizes an organization. So it's a symbol used by businesses to identify their goods uh, goods and services. Government registration of the trademark confers exclusive legal right to its use. So think of some of the famous trademarks that you see. You see the Coca-Cola symbol, for example, the McDonald's symbol. Now there's the issue of trademark dilution. Uh, dilution the use of famous trademarks in public that diminishes the capacity of the mark to distinguish goods or services or tarnishes the mark in the eyes of the consumer. Some of you may recall a movie back in the, the 80s, uh, Eddie Murphy called Coming to America, and there's a, a fast food restaurant that's represented in the, in the movie called McDowell's, and it looks suspiciously like McDonald's. Uh, but rather than having the golden arches, it's the golden arch, sing singular. Um, and you can kind of see this concept of trademark dilution in operation there. And obviously this is a fictional case, 
but uh, it, it does occur in the real world, especially when you have uh, um, certain cultures that do not respect um, um, intellectual property the way other cultures do. Um, that there's a different interpretation of how uh, intellectual property it, it, it should be used. And as a result, uh, you tend to see the, this issue of trademark dilution occur much more in those cultures. Related to the issue of intellectual property law are the use of fan and hate sites. Uh, oftentimes fan sites will, will end up um, violating the intellectual property law um, protecting certain works. For example, uh, with respect to movies, there may be a particular actor or actress that's being followed. And a lot of time, times fan sites post photos. They may post pre-releases of a movie, uh, things of that nature, and, and those are violating intellectual properties, uh, uh, property rights. At the same time, hate sites can do, this, do, do something very similar. They can, can use um, images, they can use uh, uh, trademarks and things of that nature, um, trying to damage a particular company, a particular organization. Uh, and again, that's a violation of intellectual property law. This leads to the concept of, of cyber bashing, or it's known as cyber bashing. Um, when someone ends up creating a domain, uh, creating a, a website and using a domain name that criticizes an organization or a person. Uh, an example might be walmartblows.com or paypalsucks.com, something of that nature. Now those sites are legal, uh, assuming that they they um, fall within the purview of a, of a few sp specific criteria. Um, in other words, that they're posting legitimate information, they're not being defamatory or anything of that nature, uh, and, and things like that. Again, they have to be very careful not to use the images of, a, of an organization. They don't want to use a trademark, for example, a Walmart uh, or, or these other companies. Um, but uh, if, because if they do, they run the risk of being sued, of being shut down, etc. Um, so it, it's there. There is a little bit of that ethical issue there. Section fourteen point three in the text talks about privacy rights, protection, and free speech. It starts out by talking about social networking, uh, social networks changing the landscape of privacy and its protection. Um, social media appears to be causing an evolution of privacy issues online. Today's young people are, are less concerned with privacy than, than their older counterparts. So there's a major cultural shift taking place that, that appears to redefine the barriers that marketers needed to overcome to reach customers just a few years ago. Um, there's also this global view, if you will, of, of privacy. Not every country treats um, privacy issues the same. Uh, in, in the United States, for example, we tend to see privacy law or privacy issues as a uh, as a civil issue. In other words, if your privacy is violated and it violates an acceptable use policy, for example, you can then sue the, the person or the organization that violated that privacy policy. Um, in much of Europe, however, it's seen as a criminal issue. Um, laws are, are dictated by the governments um, that tell organizations what they can and cannot do, and it's a criminal offense if they violate those. It's a different perspective of, of, of looking at privacy and how they value privacy. It's not to say that either culture is, it does not value privacy, they just value it in different ways. One technique that organizations or some organizations use to um, address the privacy rights and, and concerns of individuals is through the practice of opting out or opting in uh, certain pieces of uh, uh, participation in certain things. Opting out is a business practice that gives consumers the opportunity to refuse sharing information about themselves. This is, it is uh, a particular approach that I don't care for. The default is that information would be shared. I prefer the second approach, opting in, and an agreement that requires consumer or computer users to take specific steps to allow the collection of personal information. In other words, the default is that you're not going to share information, and that you have to usually check some check boxes or select a specific radio button or something of that nature 
to agree to allow that information to be used in, in, in a particular way outlined in the agreement. Um, and I tend to prefer that second approach more. But you have to look carefully. Not all, organ all organizations follow the same approach. Most, a, a lot of organizations, especially marketers, for example, want to collect as much information as they can. It gives them a better profile of their customers, a better profile of the individuals that, that they're, they're, they're working with. And so as a result, a lot of times marketers prefer the opt-out approach um, because they get more information that way. But So you have to look at, the, at the, the agreements very closely to make sure which one it is that you're actually selecting. When talking about free speech versus uh, um, privacy protection, the issue becomes really when does the, the right to free speech violate one's privacy? Um, there's a, a law called SIPA, Children's Internet Protection Act, which attempted to protect children in, in, uh, in schools and, and li content in libraries um, and, and restrict the information that could be obtained, certain uh, websites in terms of being visited, photos and things of that nature that can, that can be seen in, in those environments. And obviously this violates our uh, 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 free speech, but at the same time, it helps to protect our privacy. So where is that line? Um, CIPA was was uh, initially in a lower court found to be unconstitutional. Uh, that was overturned at a later time, um, in which the Supreme Court actually found that it was cons constitutional. So uh, it's based on on legal precedent. And so there's that that issue of where is that line to be able to protect our free speech yet at the same time still be able to uh, protect our privacy. The reason this is such an important issue is that the internet has really changed the price of being able to protect an individual's privacy. Uh, long, uh, long gone are the days of a lot of information being housed in various filing cabinets down at the local courthouse. Uh, obviously this made it very difficult for an individual to be able to go and and obtain information. It wasn't that difficult per se. It was simply tedious. It was time consuming. Con consuming. It was a pain. Um, and it was particularly time consuming if you're trying to gather information, a lot of information on a lot of different individuals. The internet has changed that dynamic considerably. Now you can obtain a lot of information very quickly on a lot of different individuals. So the price of protecting an individual's privacy uh, has gone up because the price of obtaining that has gone down so much. Well, the ability to collect a lot of this information is done in a variety of different ways. It's done through website registrations, cookies, spyware, RFID potentially, and, and, and as well as some other methods that are out there. As far as website registration, we provide a lot of that information ourselves. Uh, in a lot of cases we sign up for for various things and, and so we're providing a lot of information that that in, in many cases is used for legitimate purposes initially, um, but then those purposes get twisted at a later date and time. So we're, we end up providing a lot of that information. So we should be very careful about filling in required fields only um, and thinking about what some of those required fields are. Maybe they don't necessarily need all the information that we're providing. Cookies is another way to, to collect information. Cookies are a small text file that are placed on a, uh, on a user's computer by a web server that you visited. Um, and in their simplest form, they're really not that big of a deal. It allows you to store information such as the shopping cart information. Uh, you, you decide to purchase a few things from an online retailer and it stores information about what's in your shopping cart. Unfortunately, Cookies can be tracked as you go from website to website, and so they can start to gather, you, uh, um, um, people that are trying to collect this information can start to gather a, a, a more clear profile of who you are, where you're surfing, when you're surfing, things like that. Spyware's, spyware is another technique. This is software that's, on, that's been loaded onto your system, and a lot of times it's designed to steal information. It may be stealing your keystrokes. It may be stealing... Uh, credit card numbers and things of that nature. So they're literally spying on you. Uh, and that information sometimes is, is sent back to uh, their local or their computer to be able to, to harvest it for the information that they're looking for. 
RFID tags are another potential threat to, to privacy as they allow the real-time tracking of, of goods. Um, for example, the book talks about Walmart specifically using RFID tags to be able to be used to track clothing uh, in real time to be able to protect against theft and to be able to do real time inventory tracking. The book goes on to talk about RFID tags uh, already being embedded into passports and other everyday items and can be the size of a dust speck. So this gives uh, a, 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 a nefarious individual the opportunity to track individuals in real time and where they're going, things that they're doing, things like that. So it's a potential threat to privacy from that, that, that perspective. Other methods include, include things like site transaction logs, e-commerce ordering systems and shopping carts, search engines, behavioral targeting, polling and surveys, and payment information and e-wallets. Um, you can read through some of those definitions. I'll, I'll touch on just a few, but things like site transaction logs, you, you go to a website, you're creating a log entry when you visit that site. They, they know what browser you're using, what operating system you're using. Obviously, they know what time you, you got there. Uh, and they, they can monitor where you, where you go from page to page. Um, polling and surveys. A lot of times people fill out personal information. I was talking about this just a moment ago. You fill out personal information on, on, in some of these polls. And they keep track of that information. It gets combined with information from other sources to develop a more uh, a clear profile of you. The last one was, was privacy employees up there, uh, that third bullet there. Um, privacy of employees, and, and we talked about this a little bit earlier in terms of employees surfing, for example, the internet on company time or checking personal email on comp company time. And, and, and there's the issue of how much of a right do employee employers have to monitor what it is that you're actually doing. Do they have the right to monitor that you're simply doing non-work related um, surfing or can they actually monitor the sites that you're visiting? Uh, things of that nature. Now while um, various technologies allow us to violate one's privacy faster, quicker, more people uh, than ever before, more quickly, more cheaply, uh, at the same time, technology can be used for, to protect that information as well. Um, and, and they give us several examples here. Uh, P3P, P3P, Platform for Privacy Preferences, is software that communicates privacy policies, um, basically using our, like our web browser, for example, and tells us what sites that we're going to. Hey, this site's collecting personal information. You need to be careful here. Um, and, and it's a step forward of, of helping to inform consumers that this site collects information and potentially uses that information uh, in, in ways that we may not be familiar with. We can use encryption. We can encrypt our emails or, or other documents. We can use spam blocking. We can use spyware blocking. We can use cookie managers to, to disable cookies completely or to only accept cookies from the site that we're vision, visiting, no third-party cookies. Um, so we can use those. And we can also use anonymous email and anonymous surfing uh, opportunities. Uh, as far as a web browsing the web anonymously, there are, are anonymizer sites that you can go to. And several browsers now also um, um, have anonymous features built into them. Uh, the anonymizer sites are, are a little bit better if that's what you're interested in because it's actually bouncing from their server to whatever server it is that you're visiting. Uh, whereas the anonymous features built into the browser are simply not collecting any information on your local computer. So there is a difference between those two, but uh, those are some a couple of different options that allow you to, to add a, a little extra degree of protection using technology. Another issue as it relates to uh, privacy is the use of, uh, of Web 2.0 tools and, and social networking. Uh, one of the examples I used to give in class regularly was that, when it, as it related to privacy issues, is that in the United States at least, privacy is a very important issue. You talk to almost anybody and they will tell you that my privacy is very sacred to me, it's very personal, it's very important to me. But offer a 10% off coupon and they will tell you everything. And, and, and unfortunately that's true. You, you, you tag something on to um, give us this information and, and people are much more willing to give you that information. 
when it comes to web web 2.0 tools and social networking uh, uh, sites because of our desire to communicate our desire to be social we tend to want to share a lot of information we share things like our you know whether or not uh, um, we're online we offer information about where we are um, and, and things of that nature. We include a lot of this information in, in wikis and social network sites that we, we go into. We, we tend to share more information than we other might, otherwise might. Um, so these Web 2.0 tools, we have to recognize that they're great tools and they allow us to do a lot of things. But we need to be very careful about the information that we're posting to these sites. As it relates to privacy protection, there are several ethical principles that organizations can apply. To, to try to make sure that they're operating in good faith when they're dealing with, with, with individuals. For example, they can provide notice or, or, or make users aware that, that they're, they're gathering data and what that, that, that data is going to be used for. They can provide choice or consent, allowing those individuals to either uh, agree to or not agree to the collection of that information. They can provide access or participation, in other words, uh, uh, allowing consumers to be able to access their personal information and challenge any, the validity of that information. In other words, if there's something incorrect, that, that they need to be able to challenge that, the validity of that data. They need to be able to provide for the integrity or security. In other words, make consumers feel that that information is being adequately protected and that uh, uh, nefarious people can't gain access to that information. And lastly, there needs to be a, a, an enforcement or redress mechanism. In other words, if some of the information is incorrect, users need to be able to correct that information to, to address it, to make sure that it is correct, such as changing the spelling of their name or correcting an address or identifying a, a, a particular um, uh, credit issue as not being theirs. Um, and, and those are some of the ethical principles that, that, that organizations can follow to try to make sure that they're dealing with individuals in a forthright way um, and make people more comfortable in dealing with those organizations. The reason that some of these ethical principles are important to follow is that you create a situation in which there's a disconnect between expectations. For example, the first bullet point there, online privacy uh, clarification. Uh, a lot of consumers, when they, they visit a website, they see that that website has a privacy policy. And there's a disconnect between the expectations of what that privacy policy means and the content that's actually in that privacy policy. Oftentimes, those two viewpoints are not congruent with each other. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more here in, in just a second when we get down to P3P. But the idea is that, that we need to thoroughly understand what's actually in that privacy policy to know what's occurring rather than simply making assumptions that this organization is going to use our, our information as we think they're going to. Uh, the U.S. Patriot Act versus uh, um, privacy. On March 9, 2007, the U.S. Uh, uh, Department of Justice, the DOJ, said that the FBI had improperly used provisions of the USA Patriot Act to obtain thousands of telephone, bu telephone business and financial records without prior judicial approval. So there's this issue of, of, of privacy as it relates to our government spying on, on ourselves. So it's something that had they applied an ethical principle or these ethical principles, it's not something that would have happened. So it's very important to have these principles in place. Um, another case in uh, um, uh, as far as government spying on its citizenry, on September 28, 2010, the Obama administration asked for legislation that would require social networking companies and voice over IP service providers to adapt their technology so law enforcement agencies could monitor users' communication during criminal and terrorism investigations. The, the, the issue is that we need to strike a proper balance between personal privacy and national security. Um, at, at one extreme, certainly, you, you could see it from the viewpoint of, of the government really going to great lengths to be able to eavesdrop on its citizenry. Um, and, and I think that should be troubling to, to, to some individuals. Um, it should be troubling to some individuals. Unfortunately, I think it tends to be troubling to some individuals that it doesn't need to be troubling to. Um, lastly, there's the issue of privacy protection in other countries. 
uh, other than the United States. Uh, and I've already talked about this uh, to a degree, specifically the distinction, the differences between privacy protection in the United States versus much of Europe, where we treat it more of a, as a civil issue versus Europe, which treats it more of as a criminal issue. So I mentioned a moment ago, we talked a little bit more about how P3P works. P3P work, works basically by configuring privacy settings on our client, which we'll see here, see here in the image on the, on the right-hand side, on Exhibit 14.4. Essentially, we're going to configure our browser, our, our computer, to uh, um, illustrate what our particular privacy settings are, what, we, what it is that we prefer. When we go to a web page, we send in the, the GET request. The GET request is we type in the web address for the, the server that we're trying to get to, google.com, for example. Along with that, it asks for the P3P files. The web, the web server is going to respond with those policy files so that our, our machine can interpret what the policies are of the web server. Assuming that everything is OK, that, that the web server's policies are aligned with our settings, we're then going to send a GET request for the web page itself. And then the last step, the web server is going to send us the web page, and it's displayed on the client machine. Many would argue that the legal and regulatory environment simply hasn't been able to keep pace with the change of technology. In other words, technology is changing so fast and allowing uh, would-be wrongdoers um, who are interested in collecting vast amounts of information to do so in a way that it is very difficult to detect, can often go undetected for a long period of time uh, without the, the legitimate users uh, knowing that this is actually occurring. Um, and, and, and as a result, the, the, the uh, accountability of our legal and regulatory environment to be able to handle those situations is, is, is being strained. Uh, this leads us to the, the concept of electronic discovery or e-discovery, discovery of civil litigation that deals with information uh, in electronic format, also referred to as electronically stored information. As far as some of the types of e uh, data e-discovery, there are things like text, images, calendar files, databases, spreadsheets, audio files, animation, websites uh, that you visited, computer programs, even things like viruses and, and trojans and spyware. Uh, can be secured and investigated. Email in particular is, is particularly valuable uh, as a form of evidence in both civil and criminal litigation because people are often less careful uh, of, of the content that they put into those emails than they might be if they were to, to actually sit down and write out a letter or type out a letter um, that they were going to email or, or uh, mail through the physical mail. As far as how electronic discovery is, is used, um, e-discovery poses new challenges and, and there's opportunities as well for attorneys, their clients, technical advisors, and the courts as electronic information is collected, reviewed, and produced. Electronic information is different from paper information because it's a, of its intangible form, uh, the volume, the tra transience of the information, and the persistence. Also, electronic information is usually accompanied by metadata or data about data, which is never present in paper information unless manually coded. In other words, we know when the document was created, who the author was, um, this, the file size. So we have information about the document in addition to the information that's in the document. Regarding e-discovery and social networks, social networks kind of add a new um, oh, issue, caveat if you will. Um, to the, the concept of e-discovery because they're designed to be social in nature. They're designed to occur, uh, uh, to, to encapsulate our lives uh, over a longer period of time. And obviously you run the risk of death occurring at some point for, for some of the participants. Uh, the book talks about Facebook um, having developed a policy for de deceased users. Uh, talks about Yahoo and, and, and their process. And then talks about a few other uh, software applications that allow you to, to protect and, and facilitate the transition of accounts from one person to another uh, when a, a, a death occurs. Facebook now provides friends and relatives after proof of death, of course, 
the option to memorialize the profile pages of friends and, and relatives who have died. Um, so it has added a new wrinkle, if you will, to our, our idea of, of uh, social networks and, and how we deal with them uh, in, in a legal sense. E-commerce uh, technologies have also created an opportunity for things like cyberbullying and cyberstalking to occur. Cyberbullying is the use of information and communication technologies to support deliberate, repeated, and hostile behavior by an individual or group that is intended to harm others. The terms cyberbullying and cyberstalking are oftentimes used interchangeably. Uh, cyberbullying is really more targeted at, um, at, at youthful, uh, at, at youths. Um, whereas cyberstalking is typically for adults. Um, but really the concept, the idea behind them is pretty much the same. As far as the possible damage of, of cyberbullying, um, cyberbullying has become more common in society, particularly among young people. Legi both legislation and awareness campaigns have arisen to try to combat it. In 2008, a jury convicted a mom of the lesser charges for her role in a uh, mean-spirited internet hoax that apparently drove a 13-year-old uh, girl to suicide. Lori Drew created a fictitious 16-year-old boy in MySpace and then sent lo uh, flirty messages to him uh, to a teenage neighbor, Megan Meyer, who had, uh, who had said mean things about Drew's daughter, causing her to suffer from depression. After four weeks of flirting, the fictitious boy dumped the unsuspecting 13-year-old who later committed suicide. So there are real ramifications, and they're not just here in the United States. There's, the book talks about uh, some cases in England. Uh, and they're occurring most uh, oftentimes with young people, but also with adults. And the numbers that these are occurring in are really pretty staggering when you start talking about 20% uh, or more uh, in some cases. So it's a very real issue that, that we have to deal with. We talked earlier about the, the importance of both consumer and buyer protection to facilitate e-commerce. In other words, if both buyers and uh, um, sellers are not comfortable selling online due to fraud issues, uh, e-commerce is never really going to supplant traditional commerce. But uh, there are a number of things that we can do to try to facil facilitate that, that uh, um, reliance or that, that faith in, in e-commerce. And the book talks about several representative tips and sources for your protection. Uh, for example, you can make sure that you type in the correct address. So when you go to Amazon.com, for example, you can check the spelling. Make sure that you actually type in Amazon.com. You don't misspell it. A lot of times people or cyber, uh, um, you know, people that are cyber thieves will uh, purchase a domain name that's one letter off. And a lot of times you, you type in the letter, the, the web address incorrectly, it takes you to that alternate site. And since they're already trying to steal stuff, they're not worried about trademarks and copyrights and stuff like that. They try to make the website look as authentic as possible um, so that they can collect your information, hopefully your credit card information, your login, uh, username and password, things like that, um, so that they can use that information. Uh, other things that you can do, you can look at the website itself. Try to make sure there's no misspellings. Look at the, the phone numbers and see if they look legitimate. Look at the contacts, the ability to contact the, the organization. If they're not giving you any of that kind of information, it may not be a legitimate website. Uh, so there's a variety of different uh, uh, tips that you can, can look for to try to, to ensure the legitimacy of the site that you're on. There's also third-party assurance services, uh, the idea being that you're protected by some, some third party. PayPal, for example, is an example of a third party that allows you to basically pay PayPal and then PayPal pays the person that's, that is selling the good. Um, so it's a way to, for both parties to be able to exchange money without doing it directly um, by going through a, a, a trusted third party. There's the Trust E, uh, Trust Mark, there's the Better Business Bureau, um, both, with, both of which are very good um, and, and hopefully have are standing behind an organization that that helps you to to have a little bit more faith in those organizations. Um, one of the best ways is evaluation by consumers, uh, seeing reviews from other consumers, um, talking to, to family friends and uh, family and friends uh, that have used a particular website before, 
uh, is obviously a great way to go. But those are just some of the, the things that you can do to try to protect yourself. Basically, be smart. Use some common sense when you're making purchases on the web. The Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, CFAA, is a major computer crime law to protect government computers and other internet-connected computers. Initially, the scope and intent of the CFAA was to protect government computers and, and financial industry computers from criminal theft by outsiders. It's originally passed in 1984 and has gone through a number of amendments over the, over the years. The reason it's important is it, it, it's designed to protect, uh, protect, protect computers. Uh, as far as seller prote protection, the Internet makes fraud by customers or, other, uh, or others easier because of the user anonymity. So we've got to be able to protect uh, 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 sellers against things like customers who might deny that they've been placed an order or customers who download copyrighted software and or knowledge and, and sell it to others or customers who give false payment such as credit card information or, or bad checks and, and that type of information in payment for products and services provided. It needs to be able to protect sellers against the use of their name by others, in other words, imposter sellers. And it also needs to be able to protect sellers against the use of their unique words and phrases, names and slogans and, and things like that. So their trademarks uh, things like that. So what can the sellers end up doing? Well, they can use intelligent software to identify questionable customers. Um, one technique, for example, involves comparing credit card billing and, and requested shipping addresses. We talked about that a little bit earlier in the semester. Uh, it, they can, uh, sellers can, can identify warning signals, uh, in other words, have red flags for possible fraudulent transactions. If, if a person um, is located in one area of the country and all of a sudden there's a lot of purchases that are occurring overseas, that may be a, a, a red flag that says, hey, there, there, there may be something up here. The seller is going to ask customers whose billing address is different from the shipping address to call their bank and have the alternative address added to their bank account. Uh, retailers agree to ship the goods to the alternate address only if this is done. So there are some things that sellers can do to help protect themselves as well. Electronic signatures are another thing, or digital signatures are another thing that can be used to help protect against fraud in the online environment. Electronic signature is a generic, technology-neutral term that refers to the various methods by which one can sign an electronic record. Uh, essentially, it's kind of a reverse encryption, if you will, uh, and that's really kind of outside the scope of uh, uh, this chapter and really of this text. The idea is that you can use encryption for multiple purposes, and you can actually use it to generate a digital signature, which allows you to authenticate a, a particular individual or digitally sign digital signature of an individual. Now, having said that, biometric controls can be used for authentication, and I would refer you to a an online video um, uh, on YouTube, which d uh, shows you a Mythbusters segment in which they they show biometrics in action um, and and they show that the, essentially they're not foolproof so I would be a little wary of of relying on biometric controls completely for authentication but it, it, it's certainly something that as the technology improves could, could definitely become a, a much more viable uh, alternative. There's also fraud detection systems and, and when you see that it's a nice big fancy term there what it really means is data mining, and, and that's what we were talking about just a moment ago. When when you look at purchases that are, you know, a person is located in one area of the world, and that's where they make the bulk of their purchases, and then all of a sudden a string of purchases start occurring around the globe or somewhere else at a, a very far away, that tends to be a, a hint, a clue, a cue that that something is up. Or you see certain types of products that are normally purchased, and then there's a significant change in the, the types of products that are purchased. Again, that's a, a the pot, it hints at the possibility that that fraud might be be occurring. Lastly, there's the the issue of government regulation of e-commerce. The book goes on to talk about uh, um, England specifically or the UK specifically, and, and a law that allows the uh, uh, retailers or, or uh, organizations to be monitored in their social networks to make sure that they're they're not uh, making claims in these social networks that are inconsistent with the claims that they make in more traditional media such as television or radio or print. The idea being that they're trying to pr 
protect consumers against unrealistic claims that are, are easier to create in an online environment. Um, and, and again, it's just a way to help protect both buyers and sellers in terms of managing expectations and making sure that they're, they're both um, on an even playing field when it comes to making claims um, in an online environment. Section 14.6 moves on to talk about public policy and, and, and political environments. It starts off talking about net neutrality. Um, net, net neutrality is the idea that data on the internet should be treated like all the other data that's on the internet. In other words, they're nothing more than a bunch of strings of, of ones and zeros. And that regardless of whether or not it's pornography, um, it's retail, it's pirated software, it's legitimate software and songs that all data should be treated exactly the same. The argument against net neutrality is that we, by using techniques such, such as traffic shaping, we can better coordinate the transfer of, of those bits, those ones and zeros, from one location to another. In other words, it allows us to prioritize certain certain traffic over other traffic. The uh, opponents of of uh, of that, the proponents of net neutrality, if you will, um, their argument is that when you start to do that, it allows you to discriminate against one type of data over another type of data, and that when you do that, now. You, it gives certain groups the opportunity to charge more for these bits than those bits, for example. Um, and, and so it's been a fairly hotly contested area for quite some time. And, and my personal bent, my personal opinion, is I, I support net neutrality. I, I do believe that um, though things like traffic shaping are important within an, an internal network, that as far as across the internet, that net neutrality should be should be observed and maintained for as long as possible. There's also the issue of taxation of e-commerce transactions. Initially, as the internet uh, uh, just started to gain steam, um, there were no taxes, uh, online taxes, and this was a real boom for for e-commerce. It allowed it to to grow and stabilize. Unfortunately, we have seen that kind of slip away over the years to where more and more taxes are being imposed to transactions that occur on the internet. Uh, this is something that's still currently uh, undebated. There, there are different taxes that are applicable in different uh, environments on, on, on online. And we're continuing to see more and more taxes creep into various purchases that are made across the internet. And we probably will continue to see that for, for some time. Um, so any tax benefits that you once um, had by making purchases across the internet, you're slowly using those uh, year by year. Another public policy and political issue, if you will, of, uh, of e-commerce is internet censorship by, by countries. For example, you see some countries that will censor a significant amount of, the con uh, of content. For example, I, I believe it was a few years ago that uh, China was censoring certain things that that uh, Google could allow search engines to to produce when, when things were typed into the, the Google browser or the, the Google search page. Uh, other um, countries are, are rather infamous for doing similar things in countries like Iran and Syria. In a lot of cases they're trying to simply manipulate the the, the information that their citizens have. They're trying to manipulate the information that can leave the country um, and things of that nature, but it's something that's very real, something that, that, that absolutely exists. Having said that, it's also something that's very difficult to accomplish completely, uh, though, though it can certainly, um, a, a country can certainly impact to a, a large degree information that's flowing across their networks because of the, the ubiquity of technology, the ability to uh, connect wirelessly to a lot of networks and things of that nature. Uh, it, it's it's very difficult to completely censor uh, a lot of that information. Well, lots of uh, uh, organizations or departments within organizations have the job of ensuring that personnel are aware of and, and take the steps necessary to comply with relevant laws, standards, policies, regulations, and etc. 
Those laws and regulations may, for example, come from an, an, an international level. So there may be some sort of international compliance that we have to, to adhere to. There's also compliance within the United States. Uh, data pertaining to the enterprise include, uh, included in, in the law that can be used for the purpose of implementing or validating compliance is referred to as compliance data. An example of, of the necessity for compliance uh, can be seen when we talk about equal opportunity and the issue of discrimination. Think about the issue of recruiting online, that we, we use online environment to recruit, to recruit people. About 77% of hiring managers now use social media sites to check out job candidates, in, uh, according to a recent poll by executive career site Execunet. So we use something like the uh, like social media to be able to potentially recruit people, and that's fine in a lot of uh, situations. But there are a few legal risks that are that potentially could crop up if we take this approach. Think about the the uh, um, if if we're trying to hire somebody. Our population, our, our pool of candidates, should roughly mimic what the pool is of our population, the, the different ethnicities of our populations. So we have about 13% uh, uh, in the U.S. population. About 13% of our population are, are African Americans. About 15% are Hispanic. But both of these groups are unrepresented or underrepresented on LinkedIn. There's only about 2% uh, uh, of LinkedIn members that are Hispanic and about 5% that are African American. Therefore, if this is the approach that we're taking, we're underrepresenting those two ethnicities right off the bat. So we run into the a potential of of, of not being in compliance with equal opportunity um, here in the United States. Section 14.7 talks about societal issues and green e-commerce. It starts out talking about the digital divide, which is the gap that has emerged between those who have and those who do not have the ability to use technology. The issue of, of, of the digital divide is that within a country, for example, there are those who have access to technology and those who don't, and that between countries there are those who have access and those who don't. Um, and, and what that means from a societal perspective is those who have access have better access to information, better access to health care, better access to financial information, and so the gap between the two has the potential to grow larger and larger over time. How do we uh, overcome that? How do we attack that issue? Well, there's a, a few different approaches. Um, there, there's the program or the project of One Laptop Per Child, which is a, a project to provide very low cost laptop computers to kids in, in um, developing countries or undeveloped countries around the world. Um, there's also the issue of free free software, which is, is championed by uh, a free software advocate named uh, um, Richard Stallman. Uh, is a big proponent in, in open source software. So there's, there's, there's some attempts to try to address that digital divide. Another societal issue is the issue of telecommuting or working at home using a PC and the internet. Telecommuting, obviously, is something that kind of has, has, has been facilitated by the the advancements, if you will, in, in broadband penetration. In other words, high speed computing is what high speed computing and high speed networking is what has allowed this to, to become a reality. Telecommunicating can reduce the number of cars on our highways and thereby reduce per capita energy consumption and traffic congestion. We're seeing more and more companies move towards telecommuting. Having said that, there have been a couple of, of, of recent um, setbacks, if you will, as it relates to telecommuting. Um, for example, Yahoo kind of uh, rethought some of their approaches to telecommuting, uh, and instead of allowing their workers to telecommute, they decided to start bringing them back to work. Uh, I believe it was Best Buy uh, took a, uh, made a similar move. Uh, the idea being that telecommute, they just were not getting the productivity out of their workers who were telecommuting, rather than the uh, relative to those who were actually in the office working. So there are pros and cons to telecommuting. Uh, it's not a panacea, if you will, but it, it's certainly something that as technology continues to evolve, we're probably going to see more and more uh, of this. Still other societal issues uh, are things like green computing. The study and practice of eco-friendly computing resources 
It's now a key concern of businesses all, in all industries, not just environmental organizations. Um, the idea behind green computing is that we want to provide more energy efficient electronics, more energy efficient servers, and and uh, cool the ability to cool them and, and things of that nature. Um, the idea behind it with green IT, it begins with manufacturers producing environmentally friendly products and encouraging IT departments to consider more friendly options like virtualization, power management, and proper recycling habits. So for example, with virtualization, we can potentially purchase a single server that's particularly high powered, has a lot more storage space, RAM, high powered CPU, but it has the opportunity to run several virtual servers, software servers, on that one physical machine. So even though this one machine is more powerful physically, uh, is more powerful, we don't have to buy two, three, four, five additional physical servers to, to, to do this work. We can simply have one device that does it. This allows us to save physical space, it allows us to reduce our power consumption, um, and allows us to reduce the components that are going into it, so we're saving on, on resource utilization. Um, power management, so more energy efficient devices, proper recycling habits, in other words, when we dispose of them, we're not simply sending them to landfills, we're recycling co components as, as we need to. Operating greener businesses, data centers, and supply chains really isn't rocket, plan, rocket science. We, we, we talked about this a little bit earlier. Uh, one of the big things that you can do is, is, is virtualization. We just got to talking about that. There's also software management. Uh, companies seeking advice, uh, advice, tools, and processes can turn to software management outsourcing to help them achieve their software estate uh, and, and licensing management needs. And lastly, there's the, the issue of harnessing the cloud, which is, again, related to that, that concept of virtualization. Of rather than, than having virtual servers internally to an organization, we can simply outsource it to somebody that has a data center somewhere else. That uh, in, And again, a lot of this has to do with, with more, uh, to a higher degree, utilizing uh, uh, server capacity, um, not just within our, our particular organization, but really worldwide. In some cases, an enterprise may be able to cut their energy costs in half. Uh, they may be able to double their space efficiency and increase server utilizations uh, to potentially as high as 85% with some, some investment in a, a few years of, of, of investment time. As far as global green, uh, global green regulations, um, they're also influencing green uh, business practices. Um, they increasingly impact how supply chains function regardless of the location. The text talks about uh, um, regulation out of Europe, um, the uh, European Union that uh, uh, the ROHS directive, which stands for, for the restriction of the, the use of certain hazardous, hazardous substances and electric, electrical and electronic equipment. The idea that, that the, the text is trying to get across is that eco-friendly practices reduce costs and improve public relations in the long run. Um, personally, I would certainly agree that it improves public relations in the long run. As far as reducing costs, um, I, I think it, you have to be a little bit smarter than, than, than that. It, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. I think the idea behind green is that it's not about green in terms of being economically or, or excuse me, um, ecologically friendly. It's a green about money. So if you can reduce your power consumption, you're saving on your energy bills. That's where it makes sense. Um, so I would tend to think of it more of in, in, in those terms. As far as a way to be able to try to assess your environmental impact or, or how you're, you're, you're doing, there's the Electronic Product Environmental Assessment Tool, EP. It's a searchable database of computer hardware that meets a strict set of environmental criteria and allows you to look up uh, uh, various components and, and determine how efficient they are, um, how recyclable they are, things of that nature. The book finishes up talking about some of the benefits that e-commerce has provided uh, from a social perspective in terms of education, public safety, and health. As far as education and some of the technologies that e-commerce have helped to create uh, have, have allowed us to, for example, educate people online. It's to, and some of those same technologies are used to provide services in Blackboard, uh, provide educational videos through YouTube and things like that. 
Um, so e-commerce technologies have had a huge impact on our education system. As far as public safety, criminal justice, and homeland security, uh, e-commerce technologies have kind of migrated into that arena as well, allowing us to, to keep track of, of current events, allowing us to keep track of, of uh, safety issues that are occurring in, in, in our neighborhoods, in our schools, in, in uh, our, our, our region, and things like that. And lastly, as far as the health aspects, I think the book puts forth a relatively weak argument when they start to talk about the health benefits of shopping online as opposed to getting in your car and driving to the driving to the mall or to the retail outlet that you need to make a purchase from. Um, it, it, is that true? Yes, it's absolutely true. Um, I, I just don't know that that's the best argument that they could have made. Um, the second argument that they make that they make I think is much stronger when they talk about um, the health aspects of collaboration, of being able to look up things online and identify health problems at a much earlier stage than you ever could before. Um, that you're able to identify various medicines that are out there, that you're able to, to identify certain ailments uh, more quickly uh, so that you can seek proper medical help when, when necessary um, and, and hopefully catch problems before they otherwise would have been a, been a bigger problem. Um, I don't know that you've specifically heard, but I've heard of, of several different instances where people have posted pictures online, for example, on Facebook or uh, this site or that site, seen a condition, and, and then others have seen a condition and mentioned it to them, said, hey, you need to have this checked out. And sure enough, they end up with a very, having a very rare condition um, that was properly diagnosed very early on because of uh, some of the technologies that we've, we've gotten um, from e-commerce. So what are some of the managerial issues as it relates to this chapter? The first one is what legal and ethical issues should be a major concern to an e-commerce enterprise? Some of the key issues to keep in mind are what type of proprietary information will we allow and disallow on our site? Who's going to have access to the information that visitors post to our site? Do the content and activities on our site comply with the laws in other countries? What disclaimers do we need to post on our website? And are we using trademarked or copyrighted materials without permission? Another issue is, what are the most critical ethical issues? We've got to be careful about defamatory articles published online about people, companies, and products on websites or blogs that can lead to charges of libel and, and, and potentially land us in court. How can intellectual property rights be protected when it comes to digital content? We've got the issue of music and books and, and other types of content that we put online. We've got to be able to uh, address the issue of intellectual property to be able to protect that content. How can patent costs be monitored effectively? Some people claim that patents should not be awarded to businesses or, or computer processes related to e-commerce. This is an issue with uh, that, that really started with Amazon.com several years ago when they patented their their uh, their single-click purchase uh, option. What is the ethical principle of protecting the privacy of customers? To provide personalized services, companies need to collect and manage customers' profile data. That's, it just it makes common sense. If you're going to order a good or service, it needs to be delivered. They have to have your name. They have to have your address. There's, you have to make payment. So there's certain information that simply has to be shared. In practice, the company has to decide whether it would use spyware to collect data. And this process may easily cross the line from customer delight into customer despair, as in the case in Google Street View or Facebook privacy settings that, that were discussed in the chapter. Um, let's see. How can a company uh, create opportunities in the global trend towards green e-commerce? Uh, e Reducing carbon emissions and saving energy are global issues that can be serious threats, but can also provide opportunities for businesses during the next decade. First, e-commerce can save carbon emissions by reducing physical transportation. In other words, if we're not driving from point A to point B tele through telecommuting or making purchases, we're, we're polluting less. E-commerce can provide the exchange platform that trades the CO2 emission rights with the clean development mechanisms uh, mechanism projects conducted in developing countries. This is a new business opportunity. Another opportunity is the IT hardware platform for e-commerce. 
is vying for the Energy Star Excellence Award from the Environmental Protection Agency to prove, prove that their products are contributing to the protection of the environment and to gain consumer experience. It's basically a compliance mechanism uh, um, that suggests that, that Energy Star compliant components have a reduced environmental impact. Um, and so it allows buyers to purchase items that are already Energy Star compliant and therefore have that smaller impact and hopefully they'll end up saving money and it creates hopefully a demand for those types of products. So after reading this chapter you should understand the legal and ethical challenges and, and how to contain them. You should understand intellectual property law. You should have a better understanding of privacy, free speech, defamation, and, and the challenges that each one of those creates. You should understand fraud on the internet and how to protect consumers against it. You should understand the need and the necessity of protecting both buyers and sellers in an e-commerce environment. You should understand some of the, the social impacts of e-commerce. And lastly, you should understand the green e-commerce movement. This concludes Chapter 14, E-Commerce, Regulatory, Ethical, and Social Environments. Thank you.